Hello everybody, my name is Mathis, and welcome to a special announcement video. Something a little different. I have been alluding to for quite some time on Twitter and even some of my videos for a third secret quote-unquote project that I've been working on. But if you've been to any of my recent streams, or like I said, follow me on Twitter, I've kind of really spoiled whatever the surprise is. Uh, starting on November 3rd, uh, over at twitch.tv slash lost initiative show, we are going to be producing a brand new weekly D&D show for the entire month of November and then possibly after that and continuing it as long as uh, things go as well as we hope them to go. Um, we'll be talking a bit about the show, but the very first thing I wanted to do outside of announce that is actually introduce the DM, the dungeon master who will be running the game, somebody that I've talked about many, many times in other videos, and uh, the guy who really got me into D&D when I was but a wee boy at the age of 16 or 17 years old. Uh, my good friend Scott, and uh, who's been my D&D friend and DM for like 15 years, I think. Hello, Scott. Welcome to Internet World. <laughs> hey, hey, how you doing? Um, except it's November 2nd, Wednesday. What? Well, whatever. November something. Yeah. The, the first <laughs> Wednesday of November. November 2nd. All right, good. Glad you cleared that up. Whatever. It's, uh, it's fine. Um, yeah, man, uh, for those who don't know, um, I, I mean, I've talked about Scott, I used to do a, a vlog called The Friday Wrap, and a lot of the end of that vlog series, like the past, the last probably three or four months, I used to talk about D&D and, and, and the campaign that I was in and my characters and stuff, which we'll talk a little bit about here at the end, uh, but uh, the, the man behind it all, behind the story, behind running the game, is this guy right here, and uh, we are dragging him into the, into the internet entertainment era. Uh, kicking and screaming um, and by that I mean I threw the idea at him and he was into it and now we're working together on it So thanks man uh, for jumping in and doing this because as you know um, At least for myself. I am particularly picky about my DM <laughs> Welcome. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Are you excited? Oh, I'm very excited. Are you kidding me? This is awesome. So we have, we uh, we actually did try to do this video before, but then Scott decided, you know what, I'm gonna get a good mic, and I'm like, well, now you sound better, and I want to <laughs> just do this again, so we'll make it. So before we get into the show specifics and who's gonna be playing, because we have our players all set up, uh, Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about your D and D history, when you started playing, when you really, because not what people don't really know is that you've been playing D and D for a long time, but for the majority of your D and D career, you've probably DM'd more than you've played. You are the designated dungeon master. And if you are a player, you always end up as the DM at least halfway through the game. Uh, if I can make it halfway through the game, <laughs> that means the game is four sessions long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see, I've been rolling dice since I was like seven years old, but back then it wasn't really Dungeons and Dragons. I got into d and I wanna say it was July of 2000 when um, 3.0 was first released. It was a crappy summer day. I was on vacation with my parents. My dad, who is an uber nerd, uh, was like, you know what? Let's do a fun family activity. Let's all play Dungeons and Dragons together. Picked up the PHB. We rolled together characters. That was the birth of me of Levantis. And and that was it. That was sign sealed delivered. I mean, that was my entire high school and everything ever since. <laughs> I think I, I, my story is similar in that I picked up the, the early box set of 3.0 when it came out. I had heard of D&D &D because my dad, when he was, he would tell me like when he was a teenager, he played a d and I'm pretty sure is what it was, but he didn't play it a lot. Like he told me he played like a sorcerer, but he couldn't remember the sorcerer's name. And so D&D &D was something like, I think most people know of, um, but it, it interested me because I was like an uber nerd. Like I loved fantasy, video games, that kind of thing. And D&D for me at least was one of those situations where even at the even now but even more so at the time video games were great escapism but there was a lot of limitations because technology can only do so much and D&D represented the ability to remove those limitations and play out the very character you wanted to play and a story you wanted to play and I remember picking it up playing a session with me as the DM with my brother and my sister it was the intro session um, I remember it was like unicorn blood involved I think uh, in like the built-in story um, <laughs> But after that, I didn't really play too much until, so 2000, how old was I in the year 2000? I to take my age, my, I was like 12, 13, somewhere around there. Right? Yeah, so, you know, 12, probably, somewhere around there. 13, look, some math, all right? I don't do math. And then, fast forward four years later, you and I are working in the same restaurant, Applebee's, um, but there was somebody else that was working there who got to me before you did, and I started playing D&D &D with him. And it was my true, 
first step into what would be my D and D life. Like that intro campaign is nice, introduced me to it, but uh, that particular person brought me in, and uh, the very first actual character I would say I ever played was a level 18 Were Tiger Monkaville martyr. <laughs> so if any anyway yeah, exactly, if anybody knows anything about D and D, you should be shaking your head and going, "What the hell?" <laughs> because that is a very nuanced, weird character that represents very extreme, different, like, archetypes uh, that ended up dying, like, twice in that campaign that lasted maybe a few months. Um, and it was after that that I actually started playing with you, uh, who, funny story, you were his DM first. Yes, I was the one that onboarded him, yeah. <laughs> uh, probably a year or so before that happened, and he became... His own style of DM, yeah. He used to be one of my PCs. Some weird D&D incest too. happening in that restaurant. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I mean, because uh, our other friend, who is your, like, oldest childhood friend, yeah. uh, was another constant PC of mine. And, yeah, I, I spread it pretty quickly. As soon as I... You're trying to affect yeah. as many people and see where it sticks. Why do you think I started a D&D &D club in high school? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I tried to start a D&D &D club in high school after I started playing with you. Like, three people showed up, and that just wasn't enough. <laughs> did you go to Catholic school? I did. Yeah, well, you know, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the worshiping the devil and all that stuff. Exactly. <laughs> I'll be honest, like, I went to a Catholic high school, but they were relatively liberal Catholic high schools, so, I mean, that, that was good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about the show first, uh, what we're playing, where we're playing, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about my personal experience with you as my DM, and then we'll wrap it up. It's This is kind of like an announcement slash meet the DM, because... The DM is, if not the most important, one of the most important aspects of running a smooth, fun campaign. Um, so the show is going to be called The Lost Initiative Show. Uh, it will have its own Twitch channel. The link will be in the description below. We're working on getting part... I'm, I'm almost like... I'm 99.9% .9 sure we'll have partnership on day one, uh, which will mean quality options for everybody who watches, which is very important awesome. to me. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and we're going to be having I'm Scott as a player, myself... I mean, Scott as a DM, myself as a player, and three other players. Um, some you may know, some you may not. Uh, one is going to be somebody you probably all know, Bear Taffy. He's a good friend of mine. We do the Roundtable podcast every Friday together. He's the host of that show. He'll be the D&D noob. He's never played D&D in his life. Um, he is going to be jumping in. We're all going to be level one. I don't want to spoil any characters until the show. Uh, we're going to have Maggie Crone. She works for NC Soft. She's a good friend of mine as well. Um, she's played D&D a bunch. She, she knows D&D well. And then the third player is Sam Strippin, or just Strippin, or Sam. If you watch Twitch, you probably know who Sam is. Uh, he's part of roleplay as well. He is in the Balance of Power roleplay. Uh, he is on the dark side of Balance of Power. Um, and he was part of that live uh, roleplay session that was that happened last month. He's, he's a good dude. Really excited to have him on board. We're going to be playing 5th edition, which I think is the most approachable of the editions uh, of, of proper D&D. &D. Um, and we'll be playing in Faerun. Uh, yes, I don't know why I'm struggling to think the, the, the <laughs> different name for it. We're playing in Faerun. Yeah. Um, so I wanna, I'm going to toss it to you, Scott, because the, the important thing is if somebody who has never played D&D &D before in their life is about to walk in to watch us play in D&D, &D, what are the most important things they should know about the world we're playing in um, and some of the major, maybe maybe not story beats of your campaign, but story beats of the world. Because we're, one of the things we're not going to do is we're not going to sit there and give you a history lesson on episode one. Uh, uh, you can Google that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, the thing with D&D &D is all these worlds have huge thousands of years of history. Oh, um, yes. The one we're playing in is, uh, is Faerun, and nobody knows Faerun better than Scott. So, Scott, I'm brand new. I'm walking in to watch this, this show day one. What should I know about Faerun? Um before watching the story that's about to take place? Well, um, <clears throat> Faerun it tends to be one of those very high fantasy settings. So um, uh, if you're familiar with LTR, Lord of the Rings, everybody knows like, okay, Gandalf, yes, wizard, so on and so forth. But it's a very low magic world. Magic is very, it's either um, built into something intrinsic because like dwarves or elves or whatever just can do it. But um, in general, it's not really spell slinging or anything like that. Faerun is the exact opposite. There's magic everywhere, magic constantly, which is uh, which is amazing. But one of the funnier uh, things about it is, despite that fact, um, magic isn't 
widely accepted by everybody throughout the world. Uh, it, nowadays, you can always question whether or not there's like, say, a, a god or whatever, because we don't have physical proof as easily, whatever. But in the, this fantasy world, there's literally gods that walk among the people, despite the fact that the people don't necessarily believe that they exist. Yeah. They just blindly follow. It's one of my favorite parts, because you can literally go up to a peasant and cast a spell in front of them, and they're like, oh, what kind of trick is this? <laughs> so, it's so there's funny. a weird logical disconnect with Faerun. Yeah. It's really, yeah. really strange. But uh, for our first um, our first show that we're going to do online, we're going to uh, stick with what I, I'm most familiar with, which is uh, Faerun in the year 1372. It's the time frame that was came out when Faerun was released in third edition in like 2001, 2002. So um, that is a solid like 17 years after the, um, the Time of Troubles, which is, I know, one of your favorite time I periods. I love it. Yep, yep. Is literally when the gods are forced to walk on the uh, the world as uh, with the men. So, so know, like to... a quick yeah, a time of troubles with with the gods. Basically, the idea of the pantheon really quickly is there's like how many gods are there? Like a hundred? Oh, tons, tons. Yeah, I will say a hundred. We'll sure. say like there's a hundred gods rounded up, rounded so many down. Pantheons. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a huge thing. There's like there's gods for everything, but above them there is something called Ao. Never seen, no physical, doesn't talk to people. He is like the god of the gods essentially. Uh, and he got fed up with the gods basically using mortals as their servants when they should be the other way around. So he just doomed them all to mortality <laughs> for, like, how long were they uh, mortal? It was, a, it was about a year. About, about a year. year where yeah. gods could be killed and some of them were. And it yeah. was great because there are gods that hate one another and they use that opportunity to try and murder one another. Or to make truces or yeah. so on and so forth. There was one god that was kept their power to, to not allow, allow anybody else to climb the ancestral stairway and so on and so forth. Yeah, but, details but, that you should yeah, go read up if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, but continue. So there was uh, the Time of Troubles. That ended. And we're starting right after that about, right? I suppose 17 years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, a... a the world does kind of have that whole uh, Star Wars-esque, even though it's X number of years later, people seem to forget, which, <laughs> which is always so amusing. I don't so, understand, man. 17 years ago, gods were walking the earth. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Sonny. I never saw a god. You, you could go to a city where you literally watch uh, a god get murdered. You could see Mirkul be destroyed or a ball be destroyed or whatever the case may be. And speak to the people that have lived there they're in their 40s and witnessed it happen they're like i don't know maybe they're, maybe they're god <laughs> political like, okay. propaganda that didn't happen it never happened exactly it's the overlords just trying to keep the low people low <laughs> but but then of course there are the people that actually do know it and are familiar with it right. uh, there's amazing characters in the world that are high level it's one of those things again because it's such a high magic world they're extremely high level people as well so you have like whether it be the seven sisters or the children of the goddess of magic and and so on and so forth um it's just a great world it has so much story so much history it allows me to to tap into many parts of it but more importantly we're going to be playing in a, a, a region of Faerun called uh the unapproachable east uh it's a region that i rarely use i've only used so many times in the past so i get to kind of explore m more in depth a new area for me um <clears throat> while you know just sticking in a time frame that I'm comfortable with. So it'd be new for uh, us in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm excited because I don't think, have I been in a campaign with you where we've played in the Unapproachable East or at least played in the Unapproachable East for a extended period of time? Uh, no, I almost positive you never have aside okay. from maybe touching by there. Yeah. Um, over near the Unapproachable East is, um, is Damara. And, Sounds uh, familiar, but. Well, and, and then north of Damara is, um, Oh man, where was that character from? Which character? Uh, uh, Dave's old character. There's many. D? Uh, no, 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 no. Hold on one second. Uh, now it's killing me that I, I can't. Uh, it's killing me that I can't think of it. You know how awesome I am at nouns. It's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, so while you're looking that up, uh, like I said, we'll all be starting at level one. Um, the story we're gonna, Scott's keeping tight to his chest. I don't know anything about what the story is gonna be. Um, I'm actually, I'm interested to hear how you describe yourself as a DM because uh, one of the reasons I personally adore you as a DM and I have- Oh have... my God, Vasa. Oh Vasa. God. <laughs> we can't, we can't. Oh God. <laughs> there's so many, this is, we can't talk about that right now because there's so many stories. That's the great thing of you and me being, having played D&D for so long because there's just so many stories we can talk about. Um, but I was just saying, I, you know, I've had maybe upwards of like, I know between five and ten different DMs through my D&D &D life. Uh, but you are always the one that, if I have a choice, I would rather you be my DM because of your style. Now, 
There's no um, wrong way unless to. Unless it's Star Wars. Your old DM I, can call it. Yeah, so like my. He's. And I've never had him DM a D&D campaign for me, so I don't know how he is with D&D, but. Uh, I still think you'd make a, a fantastic Star Wars DM. The issue with that campaign wasn't necessarily you, it was one of the players and you together. Cry Eden, you can get over it, okay? <laughs> Again, <laughs> war stories for another day. Um, but as I was saying, like, you are always my number one choice as DM because of your style. And you, like, like I was about to say, there's no wrong way to play D&D. There are the people who play D&D for the dungeon crawl, the adventure, the the leveling up, and the awesome items so they can take down harder bosses, which is a part of D&D. And then there's those who play for the story and only the story, which is closer to the way I like to play D&D. And then there's people who do it in the like funny campaigns, like just comedy. There's no wrong way to play. No. Scott, you do a fantastic job, in my opinion, balancing both an, an, an incredible story and, and combat, um, mixing the two because they're they're all very important. I'm curious how you see yourself as a DM and like what formed you as a DM to be the way you are, which is a very weird question to ask, but I don't think I've actually ever heard you tell me why you DM the way you do. Uh, well, I suppose a couple of things. Uh, you actually touched on it at the beginning of this video. Um, <clears throat> For one, uh, I was forced to be DM at a young age. Yes. It was just simply, I was the nerd. That how, how did that happen? How, how did I become the nerd? Yeah, well, how, no, how did, how did you... I parents. <laughs> which is not a bad thing. Um, but no, but how did, like, how did you get forced to be a DM at a young age with no experience really being a DM? Well, at first out of necessity because nobody else like knew how, nobody else knew what they were doing. I was the one that really wanted to push it forward, get other people into it, so on and so forth. So since I Easiest just, way. In, yeah, yeah, I knew the rules and I was convincing others to play, I had to run it. But then amongst the people that even knew the rules or got familiar with them, um, it was either a combination of them being lazy or, or uh, just me knowing the most. Um, it just kind of worked out that way. Mm. But I mean, uh, I'm not complaining about it by any means. We certainly had a ton of fun. No, no. You like so, it. That's the thing. You also enjoy it. I, I do. Every once in a while, it's nice to take a break, but then- Be player. Uh, yeah, but that never lasts for longer than <laughs> a handful of sessions at most. Mm. But that, that aside, I actually originally started with uh, Dungeon Magazines. You know, they were awesome. They would have all these little quests inside them. So I would take them, but I, I hate cookie cutter whether it's buying a house or or anything, I hate things that are cookie cutter. I like to have my own style, my own flair to it. So um, so I would take these, these quests and I'd slightly alter them and slightly alter them. But then it got to the point where, wh what was the point of playing D&D when, when video games were getting amazing? They were becoming, like just the, the choices you can make, the uh, graphics, they were so immersive. The storytelling was so great that why even play D&D if you have these video games? Well because D&D can do more. You had mentioned before that the um, uh, the games become significantly more uh, immersive and more open world, but D&D is literally the open world. There is no prescript and there is no anything. You could try to set a campaign where everybody goes right and then people just choose to go left. Whether they do it because they're goofy or they do it because it just makes sense for their characters, doesn't matter. So I had to learn over the years to stop pre-writing stuff don't, don't have anything pre-written and literally react to my players as they go. Now, obviously you can't do it 100% free form because then you're sitting there going, ah, ah, ah. So I would do, I would approach it kind of like how you would approach giving a, a, a speech in front of a group of people or, um, or a presentation at college or whatever, which is you bullet point all the things that you want to do. And then those bullet points, as long as you touch on them, it doesn't matter what order they fall in, you just need to feel the flow. Right. So literally, I would just bullet point all my details, whether they be up here, which they almost always are, or in a uh, uh, computer or whatever, if that was a game that was running for significantly longer. We yeah. had some long games. We have had but, some really long games. Um, and that makes sense. Like the way you always run your stories for the most part, you always have like this main thread that you run through your stories and that thread can fray in a million of different places in millions of different ways. Um, but there's always like a main thing that you're trying to do now. Whether it be a main villain that that we, I mean, there's been a few times where you've introduced this low nobody who's also become a really big somebody, which can be, I don't want to say cl a cliche, but something, a trope that we see in, in things. But there have been countless other times where the beginning of a campaign, we find this low nobody who's like an, a pain in the, our ass. We're like, he's going to be the villain. He's going to be the villain. Halfway through the campaign, we find him. Uh, like drunk and like homeless in a bar because we ruined his life on the very first fight and he was never gonna be the main villain like that's what i love about you is like you know we don't you can't follow a trope because in the one i'm thinking about is uh back before 
when I can't remember his, uh, I think it was Dorian when he was initially a spell thief. Mm -hmm. Our very first fight was against a guy who was slightly higher level. He threw a fireball at us. I'm like, he's going to be the guy. Like, he's going to be the guy who's going to be fighting this whole campaign. Fast forward two months later, we actually find him drunk in a bar and, like, just destroyed because we destroyed his life. Like, oh, he's not going to be a main villain. That's weird. And that's why I love you as a DM because you can't expect certain things. Um, as far as that goes, uh, I, I do want to get into some war stories here in a little bit to kind of really exemplify that. But um, before I do, like, again, make sure you go to twitch.tv slash lost initiative show. Again, link will be in the description below. Um, it will be uh, November 2nd, the first show, just to get that out there. And uh, we'll be using the Roll20 website, so um, we're going to have layouts where you can see the fights happening when we're fighting, and then roleplay-wise, we'll just have the, the, the overlays, which I'm getting uh, mocked up for me as we speak. Hey, hey listen, I have to give a shout-out to Roll20 for a second there. I have always been anti-technology in every way, the closest thing to technology. I, I use clipboards with paper on it, okay? like I mean, you can just I look behind you and see... <laughs> how analog you are with D&D. This is the oh, first time you're playing- the pre-made char like character sheets that I've actually had somebody to change out the layout because if yep. you re Yeah, yeah. So yeah, sad. so shout out to Roll20. It, it took it took a little bit, like it probably took a week of you like learning Roll20 a little bit and then being like, all right, this is as good as I, I like as I was hoping it would be. I, I have to say probably the best part about Roll20 is, this, is the fact that with Roll20, you could actually write your own JavaScript to, to do so much stuff with it. Like yeah. it literally makes it so the world can be even more immersive than just I pre-wrote a battle on a yeah. piece of paper. You know, it's it's amazing. It allows that, that expandability that you usually wouldn't get. Like I was using a 3D tabletop before and you've experienced that. I would cast it onto one of my TVs yep. or whatever. But. Yeah, it was That's awesome. as technology as you got, was losing yeah, that yeah. on a TV. This is the first time. Dra dragging Scott into the internet entertainment era has been a fascinating experience for me. I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah. Um, but I do want to talk some more stories before we kind of like end the video and stuff. Sorry for the jump cut there. Uh, just, you know, Scott's a father. He's got to take care of little, little baby Scott every so often. Wow, you know? baby Scott, that'd be a terrible name. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't put it past you, man. Put a name your child, baby Scott. You should have uh, named it Mathis. I'm not narcissistic, <laughs> and apparently you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be, you know, what do I want to say? Um, so we were talking a little bit about your DM style and why I particularly enjoy your DM style and your combination of both being really good with story, really good with combat, and being able to go off the cuff. And uh, we were just, I was basically plugging Twitch uh, and Roll D20. We were talking about Roll D20 as well. Um, but I wanted to kind of go into a, a few war stories, maybe just like one war, because we have countless war stories. When I say war stories, talk about past D&D experiences. You have to understand, we've had campaigns that lasted five years all told, two years all told, ones that never even finished, ones that finished weirdly, um, just all kinds of uh, kinds of DMs. And I've had countless different characters that I've played under you. Um, but and it's something hopefully we can talk more about in the future, more and more war stories. But the one I wanted to talk about is surprisingly not James. Um, the one I wanted to talk about actually was uh, my my dark my aunt evil paladin um, because I think it's an incredibly good example of the way you DM and allowing you know planning for contingency A B C and D and then the player choosing Z and you not only working it but making it awesome. So Scott, why don't you pick up? Okay, the, the I can't remember the character's name. Thrusk. Thrusk. Yeah, Thrusk was my character's name. I was playing. It was a duo campaign. Me and my friend Dave. Um, and Scott was the DM, and it was, why don't you give the, the layout of the overall story, where you got the idea, and, because obviously I know where you got the idea, and how you, you changed it, because again, it goes back to the Dungeon Magazine days, a little bit, so, continue, talk about the, the setup for the campaign. So, as you said before, with my, uh, with my style, one of the things I do is I always take things and I alter them. That's, that happens to be one of my, my strong points. So whether it be I take little tidbits and I run with it, or I take like a huge story and make slight alterations to it, that's literally where I started from and it's what I've evolved with ever since. It's one of the reasons why I like working in preset worlds is because I have all this information that I can work with and work within, uh, but of course I've written my own worlds and all that stuff before, whatever. So specifically Thrusk. He was a half-orc anti-paladin that we played in, uh, everybody likes to call it Three Point Scott. Yeah. Um, and um, it was a modified third edition campaign. And he uh, was an anti-paladin of, um, oh, damn it, I, it's, I got you, it's Ball. Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. Oh, he didn't start as Ball, did he? 
he, you started off as a ball spawn, but he thought he was the anti-paladin of ball. Um, however, it wasn't actually that. He was an anti-paladin of the god that created uh, Ball, Miracool, and Bane. So, sadly, I am... Oh, the... uh, Jurgle. Jurgle. Oh, man, it's, sa That's it's right. sad that I'm turning to you for this. No, because I, I remembered. Thank you. No. Okay, so... So, Jurgle, so, so, the, so the, 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 the big crux of this campaign was that we live in the digital age anybody can google anything and so i have to write worlds wherein people like our friends uh who would like to look stuff up uh would it be able to find this information if you wanted right yeah uh, he's actually not as bad as another one of our friends who like to know stuff which is why i don't use pre-written stories because anybody can buy it read it and oh i know all the answers yeah yeah um, yeah so so anyways um <laughs> so i had to write the story in such a way that the entire time you were worshiping a god and you didn't know who it was and then eventually you were able to do so you're so right i forgot about that it was actually ball and you were getting your power from your inner ball spawn nature you know of course running off the old uh, uh baldur's gate camp uh, uh games which were amazing um and uh the whole time, you didn't know this until very late in the campaign, uh, mid-teens, starting off at level one, I believe, uh, mid-teens, you eventually found out that, no, it was actually Jurgle you were serving the whole time. Yeah. You just didn't know. And the reason why he was using you is because you were the one that he had chosen to uh, overcome all the other ball spawns, to uh, uh, pull back the power, not only of the ball, of ball himself, which was divided amongst the thousands, but also of uh, Mirkul and the soon to be re uh, resurrected Bane, because we did it pre his resurrection, and um, and give it all back to him. And at the end of the campaign, you actually have the choice of doing things like keeping it for yourself, so so. But you're a you're an anti paladin right? Yeah. And what is an anti paladin above everything else? lawful i know some people argue anti paladin's chaotic evil my opinion is a paladin is lawful whatever applies to the god so lawful evil you gave it to your god because you truly were completely yep, 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 lawful to your god yeah it was awesome yeah Loved it. yeah Loved the it. ending was good i remember the beginning of that campaign uh started with one or two solo sessions to formulate what my character was and who he was it was like six months prior to yeah we, we did yeah. like a, a couple solo sessions before, yeah, before I even played this character, before we even knew what we were going to do with this character. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the, the solo session, so he had no class. That was the greatest part. Like, I was playing this character who had no class, and through those sessions, he discovered his power, this divine power being channeled through him. That's how he became a paladin. Like, I remember having dreams, talking to, like, an imp, and all these other crazy things right into my character, who was, like, a home. he was homeless. I forget why. There was something that happened to his family or whatever. And he was just wa he was always alone. He killed them. Yeah, some yeah, there was he was they were he, dead. He, no, oh he killed Thrust them. killed his own family. Yeah. That's right. I forgot yeah. about that. And I don't remember why now, but I remember dear God, that was so long ago. It, it was his it was like his ball spawn awakening, you know. Yeah, what I mean? was, okay, always, that's right. Was but his character didn't know that. He didn't understand yeah. why he yeah. had killed them. Yeah. Um regardless, so that, that I remember that 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 particular formulation of the character having like one or two sessions and then six months later we run a campaign and it was really 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 fun uh, at least for me <laughs> uh, well to be fair you wrote a campaign along the story a character along the storyline that i wanted to write and our friends made a character that made no sense in the world he was playing a half delkir in faerun they don't even exist for, yeah i was gonna say can you explain right why that's confusing to people who don't know D D or faerun uh, i mean books right behind me over here. Faerun is one campaign setting, its own lore, its own world, its own races, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Half Delkir comes specifically from the Eberron campaign setting. It's yep. an entirely different world, entirely different everything. It's, it's, I, you could look at like comic books, the difference yeah. between like the Golden Age and the Silver Age, whatever. It's two entirely different things. Um, and he was, I allowed him to port this race over for his own whatever, but just the path that he took with it was an amazing path, just didn't fit with the other two people in the game and so it just it, it caused this like it was like a cancer growing off the side of the game that what it, actually that's probably the perfect analogy considering his character was all about growing cancers and stuff like that yeah yeah that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um but it, it was it, it had a, its own rich story that played in very well but he seriously had to take a subservient role in that campaign to make things push along well and i you know all so. credit to him man he did such a like i loved our characters together oh, God. because the personalities awesome. i love him he, he does a great job yeah so he's so good and like and that was actually one of my first like uh for the kind of characters that i play i usually play very talkative low wisdom like charismatic 
nonsense doers for the most part. Yeah. Well, that's a story for like another three hours. Um, but I, that's the kind of character I enjoy playing. And I think Thrusk was my first foray or one of my first forays into the silent, strong type. And Dave really helped me, the friend, um, kind of connect with that character because of who he was. And he presented a lot of decisions that, to my character, that I had to make that really would would dictate how my character would make those kinds of decisions later on. Like, mm -hmm. was I going to choose... I, early on, I remember him being asking me around a campfire. So, if your god told me to told you to kill me in your sleep, uh, and you woke up with that message, would you do it? And at that time, my character was like, "Yes." Like, no hesitation. Yes. And he's like, "Okay, I'll keep that in mind." But like, uh, one of one of our friend's best attributes, one of the things that I love him for, to, to, you know, yeah, it's one of the best things is simply he's always about p the party and pushing the story forward and making things work out great. So, yeah. so no matter how much of a douche you are, <laughs> <laughs> staying in character, like a, like a method actor, but like staying in character, no matter how much of a douche you are, he was like, you know what, I'm going to stick through this because there's a story here and I want to see it play out. And yeah, so, and, much, and yeah, so much props to him. Yeah, and, and another reason that, that it made sense in game for him to stay with me too is I offered, and it's something that you kind of, I think, introduced is that I offered him protection nobody else could give him. Like mm -hmm. we got along, I was the strong type, he was the talker type and i could in a lot of ways he can manipulate me too to be his muscle if he if he let me and i'm, I'm doing some terrible things early on in that game like breaking characters legs and leaving them for months and it was just terrible um evil campaign evil it campaign. was an evil campaign, evil campaign. Um, not usual <laughs> but the reason i bring up this particular campaign as a, a good example of your dm style is not only do you take a base story that you can find in a magazine and you twist it and contort it into your own personal vision that i didn't see coming like from a mile away um, was great, but it also has plenty of really good examples of you presenting an option that you assume we're going to take and then not taking and having to run with it. And one that I remember, we were level four and we were in a small town where um, they were getting protection or something. There was something going on in that small town, which eventually I basically put them under my heel as my town. Um, but the idea was you introduce, I already knew I was a paladin, uh, and you introduced, I was a lawful evil, and you introduced a, a lawful good paladin, I think, um, that we met. And we were having, like, this weird, we were sitting around a table, we were talking um, with this paladin. He didn't know I was evil, or at least he didn't know outright, because he hadn't cast detect evil or whatever. And we were talking, we were kind of getting along. There was, it was more like we respected each other's boundaries, but that was the extent of it. But then I started to realize who he was, like, the servant of, or how good he was. And this particular character had mentioned he was going to travel with us, or, like, offered to travel with us until the next town. And your assumption was that we were going to allow him to travel with us, and then at the end of that travel, one of many different things that could happen was going to happen. Instead, the minute he offered the travel option, my character said no. And came out as this anti-paladin right at the table. And <laughs> I'll never remember that the people around the table, the NPCs, kind of like put their forks down and got up and were like, okay. Mm -hmm. And Dave ate a bite of his food and smiled and watched. He's like, this is going to be good. Because Dave's character was going to go with whatever paladin ended up winning this confrontation. He didn't mm -hmm. care. Um, so instead of that happening, we had this epic clash of good versus evil in the fields where like you presented this amazing imagery of like us using our powers and colliding and like you know energy just bursting forth and like bending the plants as it like clashed from the two of us um and that wasn't planned like you had told us the plan was he was going to probably come with us or at the very least go separate ways not that i was going to fight him like the night that we meet him and there's gonna be this huge fight and uh, the fact that you're able to not only take that, but make it feel like that was the plan all along, and to make it so cinematic and so impactful that I, I still remember it to this day, um, is one is one of the biggest strengths you have as a DM, and why I think uh, you are one of, if not my favorite DM that I've ever had. And that ability is rare, I think, in a DM to be able to just go off the cuff and then make something awesome, uh, and, and make it so epic. While you were like, well, they'll probably do A, B, C, or D. And we're like, no, no, no. We're not going to do any of those. We're going to do 7Z is what we're going to go for. <laughs> um, and that that ability, like I said, like I, I tip my hat to you because no one's really been able to ever do that except for one other DM for the Star Wars campaign uh, years ago in college. And, and those, you two are the only ones that have ever been able to do that. So yeah. this is why I'm bringing you in. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly, and and appreciate it. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny because you you mentioned that character and me working off the cuff with that character making that decision. So should we just avoid the conversation of Anvari altogether and how every session was about 30,000 <laughs> times of you going off the cuff? Or? Well, go ahead. All right. We'll, 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 there's so many things we can talk about, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go one more story. Feel free, share whatever story you want. No, 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 no. I would rather talk about James. Let's just, the elephant's in the room. James is... is, is so before it, we'll, we'll let you pick a story of James because there's so many different, but like I want to give a a, a, a a quick groundwork as to who James is for the people who don't know. James is my favorite character I've ever played. He is the one that I'm most attached to um, and the one that I would I would play again, like fast forward 20 years later and like where is James now situation. I would love to play that character again. I grew so attached to him. We, we, we tried that one. We actually had a two session campaign with uh, you were playing James's daughter. Yeah, I was playing one of his kids and it didn't, yeah. for some reason it didn't take off. Um, but James, so James is, is probably my first epic D&D character. He was the character that I picked up from level one. He was before Thrusk. Um, that I picked up at level one, who was like a street rat, like charlatan, basically. He was a liar, a talker, and he couldn't fight for his life. He couldn't do anything other than talk his way out of, uh, like, situations. That was the kind of character I was going for. Mm -hmm. And we played this character on and off for five or six years. And we ended at level 16 um, with this whole thing. But what's so interesting about him is that I played him under you first for a few levels. Then we started a new campaign where I was the DM and Scott was playing. And I introduced this whole huge story. The thing with me as a DM, I don't like myself as a DM because I don't know the rules well enough, but I always put story over rules to the detriment of the rule system, basically. Uh, to the point where we might as well all just be sitting around a table and saying, what do you do next? Okay, what do you do next? GURPS. Yeah, it's very GURPS-like if you people know I, what GURPS I, is. I, I, I've been saying it for decades. I know. G Gurps. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we'll get to play Gurps one day um, on the show. But uh, how many times have you shot me down? Um, I we made we <laughs> made. Listen, I'm not going to get into it, but we made Gurps characters at one point, and we never played. <laughs> all right. Yeah, true enough. Okay. Um, so yeah, so then I picked up and I made this huge world with this huge story. I don't want to go into the story right now. But then I decided I didn't want to do this anymore. I wanted to play in this world that I made. I don't want to control the world anymore. So after some talking, Scott's like, "Fine, I'll DM." do one or two more sessions to wrap up my character, and then I'll just take the reins from you. And that's what we did, and then I came back in with James, who was around the same level through this really cool story where I was playing James, but not really playing James. Again, we could talk about that another time. Uh, but he was my character that basically went from rags, it's your rags to riches story, but there's there were so many twists and turns, and I'm so attached to that character because I put so much work into him um, that he will always be something very special to me. Uh, so... And Scott, you know, over the years, you had to learn how to DM for this character because of the way he was. Also intimately learning this character's thought process. He was chaotic neutral that eventually turned chaotic good. That was that was his, his arc. Um, so I'm, go right ahead. Set up whatever story you want to tell about James. The floor is yours. Well, let's start off with his name's Captain James Patrick Robert Henry McCoy III, the werewolf lord of Port Verge. At the okay. end. At the end, he was the at werewolf the lord of Port Verge, but he's not. he wasn't a werewolf in the beginning. Sure. That doesn't change the, the, the fact. And yeah. um, I, I think it's funny because, you, like you said, you did start off with him at level one as a, uh, as a scout, a scout, I believe. Yep. And then he was your NPC for yep. a little while, but he was one of those NPCs that some DMs have that he's just like, why, why aren't you just playing this character? <laughs> <laughs> How many times are you going to trump all the other NPCs around you with this, with this, like PCs around with this one NPC, whatever. So um, eventually we uh, did that transition where uh, you lost your ship yep. and, and, uh, and took over as PC, I took over as DM and ran with it. God, I love that character. Um, I, I suppose the story I would want to do, I suppose the story I'd want to do with that one is, um, I don't know, with, with with James, everything was always, he was always outside the box. So you played that character, I think you played him with nine wisdom. And um, mm -hmm. and you're a heavy role player. Not everybody plays that way, whatever. You're a heavy role player. So you actually played him, or eight wisdom? It was it was below 10, eight or nine, probably. Yeah, I think it was actually an eight. Which, yeah. in D&D &D terms, is like, I mean, he's not wise, but he's not like incapable. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's just eight wisdom. Yeah, all right, yeah, low average. Yeah, low <laughs> average. Uh, not not extremely in hindering. Uh, so he was eight wisdom, uh, and you you played that character. So he made uh, a lot of terrible decisions with a lot of flair. And and I, I don't know. I 
I just loved playing with him so much. Um, well, because so the I, to counterbalance that, to throw that out there, his eight his wisdom was like an eight, but his charisma was like at the end like an eighteen. Or no, at the end it was like over twenty. It was like a yeah, twenty a something. Seventeen at start. Yeah. Yeah, it started was like a seventeen. So again, a lot of personality. He could talk his way out of anything, but he got himself in those situations with the eight wisdom. So uh, continue. Lo lo lovable with, with terrible decisions. But I, I don't know. There's so many things I love about that character, any particular story. So I mean, with that character, you had a big romance. You had so. Uh, why don't we talk about romance with that campaign? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go for it. If that's what you want to go for, you're welcome to do so. No, no, no. no. That, that, that's fine. So I think one of my favorite parts about that was, um, I think it's probably your favorite story, uh, which was the time that I cast Insanity on the character. It's one of my favorites. So it was, I mean, the character was, he just went through an extremely dark time. Uh, his friend had just recently died and um, uh, been re-risen. He was already in a very dark place in, in his own person. And so um, casting insanity on somebody, dropping his wisdom to, uh, to a one, certainly could have been, made him one way. But instead he went very much, because he was already in a dark place, it yep. just um, over-exaggerated. It was like uh, holding a magnifying glass on that. Uh, his state of mind at that point, you made him almost Joker-esque. Yep. So he, had, he was effectively chaotic evil is uh, what he became. And um, he was almost bored by his own chaos too. He didn't yeah. enjoy it. He would do the most chaotic and ridiculous things and just be bored by it. It just wasn't enough for him. He wouldn't even revel in, in even half of the moment. It was just, eh, let's do the next thing. Yep. Uh, the whole point of that campaign, without going into too much detail, was to uh, collect all the bits and pieces of an ancient artifact, uh, which is a statuette of Koratiti. Yeah. And you had, I believe at that point, you had on your person one piece. Yes. Uh, the rest of the party had other pieces. And that one piece is a piece that allowed you to teleport anything, anywhere, uh, indefinitely. It was like a combination of like gate and uh, dimension door with very... Li um, uh, loosely lipped uh, limitations and just the stuff that you did the havoc that you wreaked on your enemies so I mentioned the werewolf lord of Port Verge yeah. the the uh, the prince of Port Verge is a principality in Iberon whatever uh, the prince of Port Verge was an ongoing antagonist in the party uh, in the campaign never the big antagonist just an all constant thorn in your side that would cause that would always make things difficult and and you just took this moment to fuck it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I did. My cat, because like you said, like it was just a moment. He was so dark, and his wisdom was a one. So there, to him, there was no such thing as consequences to anything he was gonna do. And he just had this moment of, I'm just gonna kill him. You, and I, you literally, you just wreaked the the craziest havoc. It was it was the the best. Because it was so like, like what is how was the world? Because if my own chaos wasn't enough, the character's thought is, well, let's just throw the world in chaos and see what happens. Mm. One, one of my DM styles is actually specifically to try to make the world, to try to have every individual character react like a real person would in that situation. Obviously, it's impossible to think of how an elf would react to their ancient world being destroyed. Yeah, whatever, we're humans, we live normal, modern day lives, whatever. But within the world itself, within that scope of the characters, try to make them as real as possible, yeah. right? And so... The stuff that you did, reacting to it, making, like having to bend the world and all the history of it afterwards, God, that was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, the way that the party, because of the, 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 <laughs> took Dave, and I teleported him. To, uh, <laughs> I took one of my own friends right before I went and killed him, and I teleported him into the ground. Absolutely, way way down below. And so for that, like for that version, because of what the way you described it, you wanted to do, I was more or less imprisonment. Yes, right? exactly. Because you know, again, artifact, whatever, blah blah blah. So um, uh, that was my favorite part about that in particular, um, like fa favorite story, I have to say. But I think my favorite part about your um, playing that character um, in that game, that campaign. So now I'm going to talk about you, off of James, onto to, to Mathis, because we haven't talked about you as a PC yet. You can right. talk about me. Um, I do everything I can utilizing the, what I know of the actual PCs and what I know of the actual characters, what I know of the world and what I'm trying to develop to write things around it. So it all buttons together beautifully to, to the best of my ability. I'm not the only person that writes a story. Um, if there's four PCs, I write, you know, a third of the story. The other two thirds comes from you guys. But I have certain limitations. I can only work within the boundaries of you guys. Well, in that campaign, you had another piece that allowed you to manipulate time. Sure, yes. that one was space. You had another one that allowed you to manipulate time. Yeah. So I allowed you guys to go back in time. And going back in that time, was the end. you can do things. Yeah. 
Yeah, near the end. And going back in time, that allows you guys to... Uh, oh my god, I know what you're going to talk about. It just clicked. Go, oh, it's one of my favorite parts of the campaign. Sorry, go ahead. Continue, please. You could have done anything. And speaking of continue, yeah. um, you and I both have the same idea that time travel is continuums. I mean, uh, I love Back to the Future. The biggest fault of Back to the Future is the ending of the movie where you're yes. like, oh, wait, it's not a continuum. It's an alternate reality. Yeah, it's it's the the, the end. The last scene of that movie is the worst scene, and uh, otherwise it's a perfect movie, right? And um, the way that you approached it, and out of game, convinced the other PCs to approach it that way, to not go down this path of trying to alter all these things. You would try to alter things, but in the scope of continuums, expecting things. And and I just we never discussed this. No, we just came to this, and, and I, I could see it, and I read off of it, and and we made it so. The world, everything that happened in the future happens in the past. So there was. So yeah. We talk about specifically why it was that um, your significant other. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why it was that. that um, she shunned me, basically. Why she shunned so, you. Yeah. It, may I set this Take up? It, so, please, like, okay. there was a point in time where, like, I had a, an in game romance. It just sounds silly, but, it, like, my character was in a relationship, basically. First mate. And there was this point in time in the game where. She didn't understand, at least to my character's knowledge, she didn't understand what I was doing and everything I was doing was chaotic or, or not right and it was whatever. And to the point where I tried to approach her at one point and she just basically kicked me out. She threw a tantrum, she kicked me out and it set my, like being shunned by the one person this, this character basically could trust and loved, set him down a path that was the right path basically. It, it needed to happen, this, this, the whole catalyst situation. of going uh, chaotic, neutral, chaotic, chaotic good. good. Yes, Absolutely. it was basically Perfect. the catalyst to send my character from neutral to good, and it needed to happen. However, um, later on, that character got a piece that allowed him to travel back in time. And the moment in time my character chose to go back to was to talk to her before she threw the fit and kicked me out. Little did I know, or you know, whatever the the. My, my romance wasn't going to throw a fit, wasn't going to kick me out, was going to coddle me and keep me safe and basically say she loved me. And so I went back in time to talk to her and I found that out and I'm like, no, you can't do that. You have to kick me out. You have to act like everything I'm doing is terrible. Don't, uh, don't ask why, you have to trust me and just do it. And I convinced her to do it and she trusted me and then I left, like I went back to my time. And that was like, me going back in time, talking to her to convince her to kick me out, to send me down the right path, like that loop, the continuum as we talked about, was such an imperative moment for my character's mentality um, that it made my character who it was. And I was, I completely forgot about that. Like, I mean, I, I remember it, but it wasn't even what was I was what I was thinking at the time. That's another moment that I just, it, it's again off the cuff, reading what I'm going to do as a player and going with that and making it work and making it work like it was meant to work is so important. To explain this a little further, it's not even like we could talk about this between our three hour sessions. No, no, no. Our sessions lasted anywhere between, we'll say seven to 15 hours. Each Serious. Week. There were so many times where I would, hours. we would play overnight till 7 a.m. and I had to go to work after. Yeah, you would come from work. Yeah. Sometimes maybe take a shower at my place or whatever it was. And you would go to work start the game, leave the game. It was, it was insane. We would skip sleep. We would do whatever we wanted to. So we didn't have time to set up this kind of stuff. We just played. Yes. We were, became these characters. Yeah, it was fun. It was awesome. Yeah, there's so many things. And like, I don't want to go into a million war stories, but like a little thing, I remember we were going through trials and at one point, like, you, like it was two dragons were asking me to repent and I wouldn't, but that was so in character that like the dragon let me go by. It was really, it was... Ah, we could talk for hours. Like, James, like, I, I'm talking about hours of talking about James and Thrusk and other characters that I've played. Uh, we, we could I, talk I, about I think we pretty much need to make it solid that we're going to have to do more war stories. Yeah, no, there's so much we could talk about. <laughs> so yeah. much we could talk about. And that's just me. Never mind, like, bringing Dave on to talk about war stories and other people. Nick, God, I know you have such unique stories with your friend, with our friend. I don't know why I said your friend. With our friend, Nick. There's so much to talk about, and I really, like, that's the thing, like, if this goes well, one of the things I'd love to do is just do monthly war story sessions, just talk about this stuff, because it's fun, because there's stories to be told that are just entertaining. Um, but this this video is already going long, and I, I do want to wrap it up here. Um, I, I'm glad I got to introduce you to the world, Scott, I'm, ex I'm to the internet world, rather, mm -hmm. and I'm excited to, to run this campaign uh, with you and these other people, and uh, bring about this show. 
Uh, it's something that I've been I'm playing with for a few years now, and I'm glad you know we finally decided. All right, fuck it, let's let's do it. No, no, no. You asked me to do this a year and a half ago, and I said go pound sands. <laughs> You made my wife make me do it. <laughs> and now you're happy though, right? Like now you want to do it. Yes, I'm actually wicked stoked now, but but you 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 I was strong armed. Yeah, it happens. You gotta get the wife involved, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you, Scott, for joining me on this weird intro video slash interview slash war story thing. Basically meet the DM. Um and I hope people are gonna be seeing much more of you very soon. Hey yeah, if anybody wants to uh get a hold of me, shout out or uh, have I mean, what's your Twitter handle? Yeah, it's actually, it's at Dalric, that's at D-A-E-L-R-I-C. I'll have that in the, I'll, I'll try to either have that in the video itself, but it'll definitely be in the uh, comment section below awesome. as well. And if people want to find me, you already found me because you're on my channel, so <laughs> appreciate it. Thanks, Scott, and uh, we'll see you again on camera November 2nd. Awesome. Bye-bye.